As an introduction, we'd like to acknowledge that our mission at Vos Library is to advance learning, inspire curiosity, enrich lives, and promote community. With that in mind, let me introduce our guests. Jerry Boyle is the author of 15 crime novels, including the acclaimed Jack Moreau, McMorrow, sorry, mystery series. His latest McMorrow novel, Random Act, was awarded the 2020 Maine Literary Award for Crime Fiction, the second time a McMorrow novel has been chosen for that honor. Jerry is also the author of the Brandon Blake mystery series featuring a young Portland police officer. His novels have been published in half a dozen languages. Jerry's fiction is set in Maine, often in rural parts of the state, where his reporter protagonist searches for stories and frequently finds trouble. The author lives in central Maine in a village on a lake. In addition to writing crime fiction, he's been a newspaper reporter and columnist, and for many years was the editor of Colby College Magazine, published by his alma mater. And trained as a medical doctor, Tess Gerritsen built a second career as a crime novelist. Her 30 novels, include the Rizzoli and Isles series on which the TV series Rizzoli and Isles is based. Among her titles are The Surgeon, Gravity, Playing with Fire, and Choose Me. Her novels are translated into 40 languages and more than 30 million copies have been sold around the world. She lives in Maine. And I wanna just say a warm welcome to both Jerry and Tess. Thank you, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will start out and uh, thank you for having me and also having us. Uh, and I'm really enjoying, I haven't been in an event with Tess in some time. So I'm looking forward to what she has to say. No pressure or anything, but I think it's going to be really good. And so I, uh, I, uh, so this is fun for me as well. <clears throat> I have to say that here we are on Zoom again, and there was a there was a time you know I was thinking back where when all of this started when I was partway into a the an, um, McMorrow novel that I've just finished, and I got kind of stalled. You know, I, I thought ugh, I was going along, and all of a sudden the world just seemed to be coming down around our ears. And I thought, well, here's my little story, you know, well, it's not so little, it's actually really, really, really good. But it's, uh, but it was, uh, suddenly it's, it, I was wondering whether, whether I should keep going even, you know, I don't know if you all remember the, the time when this was all new, and, and it was spreading and things were getting serious. And, and, uh, and then it was hard for me to uh, just go into my study and continue my story you know it just suddenly all of it seemed a little bit irrelevant and so uh i got over it of course uh but but there but for a little while i i was concerned you know and i spoke to other writer friends and they all had kind of the same reaction you just felt like the world that you had been writing about had been somehow upended and and so uh, like events had overtaken us. So, uh, but then I realized, you know, after a while, you know, I don't, I can't remember whether it was weeks or maybe a month of this sort of inactivity. And I think I can speak, I think I can speak for Tess when a writer who can't write is really an unhappy, unpleasant person to be around. And so, you know, we get restless, we're kind of fidgety and jumpy and, you know, when you're not creating something, especially if you've started something and it kind of got stuck. And so I felt like the story wasn't stuck, but I wasn't sure how to place the story in the perspective of our what was now our new normal. And then I realized, you know, after a little while that I needed, in some ways, I, and I hope readers, needed these stories more than ever, you know? And so uh, suddenly a story about one bad thing that happened, or two, or three, depending on how long the book is, uh, seemed like, and especially something that bad that happened that kind of got fixed, you know, we, we were, I was creating a, a situation 
where something very, very difficult happened, something kind of awful. And yet by, I knew that happened, let's say that happens in probably page, I don't know, in the forties, if something that's really bad happens. But I knew that page 300, I couldn't undo what had, what had happened that was really bad, but I knew that I would resolve it in some way and life would go on as it had before the bad thing happened. And so, uh, so I found myself in my own reading life, turning to crime novels, mystery novels, and I started going back, back even from modern uh, crime and mystery. You know, I went and found like P.D. James' first two books, and you know, and and I read them, and I th and I and I realized what I was doing was, it was um, a total sanctuary from everything that was going on around me. You know, I, I was in England, I was, you know, in, on the moors, uh, there was a bad guy, but I knew that, uh, that the detectives would figure it out by the end. So I could just kind of enjoy the ride. And so there was a whole period of that before I finally realized that maybe the books that we write in this genre would serve that same purpose. So it was kind of funny though, to think that a novel about a murder would seem kind of quaint, you know, especially, you know, at some of the, some of the books I know, uh, Tessa's books, you know, they're, they're not quaint like P.D. James and, uh, and mine are not quaint like P.D. James, but at the same time, it's this sort of uh, microcosm where things can get, things can get fixed. Everything isn't overwhelming. And so, and, and these insoluble, massive problems. So I started going to the library. I live next door to the library in the town where I live and taking out all the old stuff. You know, I, I would just clear the shelves and, and bring them all home. Stuff that hadn't been taken out of the library in 15 years. And, and sometimes I found that the person who took it out 15 years ago was me. And so, uh, so I, uh, uh, so I think that that rejuvenated me, and I reached a point where I plunged on, and so continued you know, with the book that I've just uh, finished. I, at least I think it's finished. The editor may not think it's finished, but it's 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 getting there, and uh, and so. So I had to keep, you know, I had to keep going for a couple of reasons. One was for my, my own kind of uh, solace in this time. And this is a, not a real downer. The book, the book is both really good and really funny. So don't feel like this is a really down thing. But I also had to uh, keep going for another reason, which is when you start these books, and now that I'm back on track, I wanted to talk a little bit about why, the, why we do this at all and what drives us, you know, uh, Tess is remarkably productive, just all these stories, all these people, all these things you make up. And, and what I found was when I was having a little bit of my doubts there that, you know, how do I go on? Does this really, uh, is this really the right thing to be doing? You know, sh should I be, I don't know, down at some clinic somewhere? And, and, uh, and well, Tess would be better at that than I would, but, you know, I, I could help out in some way. Uh, I, I think that it was an interesting situation and something clarified for me. What happens with these books, and this is the way they start, uh, at, at least in my case, is that I've got my, I've got McMorrow and I've got his wife, Roxanne, I have Claire, I have these standing characters who in that particular series are like old, old friends. You know, they're like the people who live in my village who I've known for 30, 40 years. And we've gotten older together, you know, our kids have grown up and left together, you know, and, and those are my, my old friends. In fact, they're probably I've spent more time with those fictional friends than I have with actual friends, since I'm not with my actual friends for hours and hours a day. But what happens with these books is you're going along and, and sometimes that you're not, not sure where it comes from. Suddenly someone enters your world who, and then they come out of nowhere. And you have these uh, characters who will be with you for a book or maybe two in, in an unusual case, who you feel like they've kind of visited you. And so, and once you've kind of, you've either they've latched onto you or you've created them, you feel a responsibility to see them through. So I had a character in this new book who I really was 
uh, fond of. I have several that I'm fond of. And usually it's kind of funny. Often I'm very fond of the really bad people. Um, and so, you know, I find them really fascinating. And then I have to think to myself, wait a minute, you invented the person. Of course you find them in fascinating. But I think that there were people who I found I was had a real attachment to and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't just abandon them. So the book had to be finished. You know, I had, I had created a person who didn't exist before and, and I had placed them in this sort of predicament uh, and situation um, where I couldn't just walk away. You know, it would have been, it would have been really irresponsible and uh, in, in an odd sort of way. So I carried on and, uh, and found that I had, was faced with sort of the dilemma of, when does this book take place now? Is this in, in contemporary times? Is this uh, in uh, pre-COVID, you know, none of this ever happened. We're, you know, we're, we're in this, the 19, or we're in 2017 when life was good, you know? So, or is it, so how do you, how do you address that? And so uh, I thought about it and, you know, and I, and I even, I don't know, uh, other writers also consider this, do you suddenly put aside what you're writing and write a kind of a COVID book? You know, someone, I don't, this is just totally off the top of my head. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> no, Jerry. Well, well, he's got another Zoom meeting in his house right now. Maybe the bandwidth just caught up with him. Couldn't do it. All right. Well, I guess we should um, maybe give him just a moment to see if he, his name has yeah. not gone away yet. So he may still be able to join us. Oh, come back, Jerry. <laughs> yeah. No, he's gone. He may be signing back on again. Yeah. Yes. Let's give him just a moment. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. Here we are. Wow. Tech, tech glitch. Oh, he got 15 minutes in. Yeah, he did. <laughs> You know, he got the conversation started, which was really interesting. It sure was. I was really intrigued. Um, yeah. You know, as readers, we get into these characters, but as authors, hmm, whole different world. All right. Okay. Well, Tess. Well, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna bounce off something that he just said, which is Thank the you. effect of COVID on our on our writing. Um, and he, you know, it's so, it's so fascinating that he and I had similar reactions when the pandemic started um, and, and things were looking so horrible in New York and New Jersey and all those people dying. Um, and I'm a doctor, so you would think I'd be somewhat qualified. And my first impulse was, what am I, it's exactly like Jerry, what am I doing here writing these silly stories about people that don't exist when real people are dying out there? I should be... I should be volunteering and going to a hospital, even though I'm totally unqualified anymore. Um, but but that was, I think that was the same thing I felt after 9-11. It was, what am I doing here telling my stories or being on book tour when I should be at a hospital or out donating blood or something? Um, and I think that's a very human reaction. But now that I look at it in retrospect, I, I remember Agatha Christie's books during, during the bombings of, of London, when people were huddling in their, their, their shelters, the big source of comfort for a lot of English people was to read an Agatha Christie book. It took them out of their, their horrible reality and put them into something that was somehow comforting, even though it had to do with murder. Um, and, and I remember after 9-11, all the publishers were thinking, well, What's going to sell now? Everybody's shocked. We're all in, in, in you know, we're all traumatized. Um, and the idea was that sweet romances would sell really well. That's that's what everyone was going to want. Something that would be comforting, a nice romance. Um, and it just so happened that my book, The Surgeon, came out. I 
I think it was like the week before 9-11. And we were all thinking, oh my gosh, it's a serial killer book. The last thing people are going to want to read is a horrible crime story about serial killers. My book sold so well after 9-11. It's like the sales went up. And I realized then that, you know, it's escapism. It's, it's jump, diving into a story where people are really um, in trouble, where we can be afraid in a, wor in, in a fictional world and yet, as Jerry was saying, there is a happy ending. There's justice. And that's the trouble with terrorism. You never feel like there's justice. You always feel like it's always going to be unsettled, that, the, that, that, that there will never be an end to the problem. And I see Jerry is back. <laughs> and I, I would like him to finish, but as soon as he comes back and unmutes himself, I will, I will cede the stage back to him because I know he's about to say something. Oh, Jerry, are you there? <laughs> I am here. I'm trying okay. to. Uh, we lost our internet here because of uh, the, Storm. What, the, wind, the wind. So, okay. Why don't you I'm, continue? I, I was just jumping in a little bit about the pandemic, but go ahead. Okay. Well, I will. I will uh, continue, but only briefly because I can see that we. I have two more minutes, and so what I'm going to say is that uh, there, there. What I was saying with their characters that we create who we feel responsible for. You know, the, these people didn't exist before you invented them, before you thought of them. And then you have to see them through. You have to see where they are going and, uh, and also, um, I'm gonna start my video. There we go. And, and also uh, what is gonna happen to them. And so I think that's what drives me uh, into these books. You know, in, in some ways I, I feel like the, the standing characters, the central characters who return book after book, they're always gonna be there. But when I came, there's a, a character who came to me and I don't know, Tess, where your characters come from, but I often find them like I'm driving the car or I'm, uh, we had a lot of work I was doing on the house this fall. And so I'd be up on the roof you know, and we have a very old house that requires a lot of work. And so I'd be up on the roof, you know, caulking or something or painting something. And all of a sudden, some, you know, something you've been puzzling over, boom, you know, when, the, when you least expected it, when you're on top of a ladder, one time it happened to me and I hired one of those lifts, you know, I was up on this thing that's driving me around the top of the house. And all of a sudden something came to me about a character that I've been puzzling over. And in this case, the book that I've written, which is called Robbed Blind, there's a character named Sparrow, who's a young woman. The book revolves around people who work. It started out to be about serial kind of convenience store robberies. And I've spent a lot of uh, time in convenience stores for the last year, because uh, they're open 24 seven, you had to wear a mask, but you know, it was, it was still good. And, but there's a whole, it, it started out with just robberies and then it started, then it became a really a book about all the people who work, you know, the 11 to seven in, in these places. And so her name is Sparrow. She's really interesting. She's taking care of her sick ex rock and roll in his head star father who is, who has, who has um, all kinds of physical problems based on his lifestyle. And so I, I had to, keep going for Sparrow. So I, keep, I kept writing for Sparrow for month after month after month, you know, and, and I felt like, you know, part of you was saying, well, okay, Sparrow, I'm, I'm, we're together here. We're gonna see this thing through, COVID or not. And, uh, and so in the end, to get back to that point, uh, I decided to write it as a post COVID story. It was very hopeful and it was actually kind of refreshing to write something where this was over, you know, and there's a scene where, uh, where someone comes in to commit a robbery and they have a mask on. And at first she looks up and she gets this little bit of a flashback and says, oh, it's just another COVID person, you know? And then, so the guy has to kind of convince her and you know, it's not COVID, I'm really a robber, you know? I, this is a real gun, you know? Uh, and so take me seriously, you know? And, and in her mind, she's saying, well, people just not, won't they just give up this COVID thing for once, you know, what's with the masks? And, uh, and then that uh, actually happens probably on the second page. So there you go. There's where I am and uh, the wind is blowing and, and I will turn it over to Tess. 
Um, I, I just keep bouncing off whatever you say, Jerry, because you always say such interesting things. Um, so he was just talking about COVID. Do we write about COVID? And um, I was left with that challenge because I was working on a book just as COVID started. And I thought, you know, this is going to be over with in a year. This pandemic will be over with in a year or two. And then if I write a book about COVID, it will be dated um, by the time it comes out. So I, I did not address the pandemic except uh, in a post-pandemic way so that when Jane Rizzoli walks into a hospital, she thinks about all the people who died in this ICU a couple of years ago. And she also, there's also a point where she doesn't shake anybody's hand anymore. And I think that's probably the way it's going to be in the future. We're gonna stop shaking hands. Um, so that was, the only, that was the only way I really addressed it. I just didn't wanna go there because I've, I'm always worried that in 10 years, people are gonna go, isn't that quaint? <laughs> um, that was the time that passed. Um, and the other thing that Jerry said, which I found really interesting was how you get ideas in the car. Now, the, uh, there is something to be said when you can't figure out what your book is doing, where the plot is going, to put it aside and go for a long drive, because that's exactly what I do, or I go for a long walk. I find that if your brain is um, focused on something else, something that's really kind of routine, like driving a long, boring ride and, on, on Route 295, um, that's when the ideas come to you, because your brain is not, is not fixated on this. It's allowed to relax. And then it sort of lets these, these ideas kind of filter in. Um, and I have had some of my best my best ideas have come while I was traveling, when I was focused on something, kind of semi-focused, um, and then all of a sudden that idea comes in. I mean, I remember I can tell this, I think I might have even told this story um, at, uh, at Soup and Suspense a couple of years ago. So I was working on this book called um, Vanish, and it started off with a, um, a woman who wakes up in a body bag in the morgue. Uh, but when I had my first draft, it was a man who, was, who is declared dead. He's in a body bag, um, more aisles, hears a noise, she unzips the body bag and finds a man in there alive. Um, so she takes him to the hospital and there he does something unexpected. He shoots a security guard. He takes hostages. Um, and so it becomes a hostage crisis. So, you know, there's a lot of excitement there, a lot of stuff going on. But halfway through that book, I was so bored. I couldn't write anymore. I didn't know, I, I didn't know why I was bored. So I went on a long drive and that was, and it was in Texas. So it was a really long drive. And um, somewhere during that long drive through really boring territory, it came to me why I was bored with that story. I was bored because who takes hostages in this world? It's always men, it's always men with guns. Um, and then I thought, oh, well, what if it was a woman? Now it becomes interesting, now it becomes weird and it needs to be explained and now there's a mystery here. So uh, that's, that's how I came up with the fact that it was a woman in the body bag. Um, I didn't go back to, to revise it at that point. I just kept writing from there on to the end of the book. Um, so if you were to look at the first draft, you would have been very confused. It starts off with a man and all of a sudden it's a woman. And, um, but that, that is how I got through that particular case of writer's block or plot block, how you, have, you know, whatever you want to call it. The long drive, the fact that you're semi-bored, uh, that you're doing something else, and then your brain finally allows you to relax enough to, to have these wonderful ideas come in. Um, so the question also that Jerry brought up was, um, do we write for our characters? Why, why do we keep writing? I mean, I, I, there are times when I think, why can't I relax? I'm getting really old now. I should be doing, I should be, I should be out in a garden or, or doing something, uh, you know, traveling. But there's this compulsion. I, I don't know any other way to say it, except we are possessed, Jerry. <laughs> Sometimes we're possessed by our characters who don't want to be let alone, who don't want to be left alone. Um, I think the one time I can go back and look at my own books where that happened was, um, I had written that book about the surgeon, uh, called The Surgeon. It's about a serial killer who does really horrible things to his victims. And at the end of that book, he was still alive. He was in jail, but he was still alive. And I was ready to move on to the next book, but he never left me. He was still like, lurking in the back of my head, kind of whispering, don't you want to know what I do next? Don't you want to know the next chapter of the story? And um, it got so ridiculous that um, I was working on a book about poison gas at the time. And um, finally, my editor said, so where's the next book? And I said, well, you know, I'm writing this book, but Warren wants another book. Warren was the name of the character. And um, it got so bad. He just felt so real to me that my husband and I would have conversations about Warren. 
we'd see some horrible crime on television and my husband would say, oh, Warren could have done that. Um, and we were on vacation in Italy, passed by this big roadside stand that said, come and visit our torture museum. And my husband said, you know who wants to go there, don't you? It's, it's, it's Warren, you know, Warren, as if the character is in the back seat, kicking, kicking our, our, our uh, car seats. So we went to the torture museum. I got home. I called my editor and I said, I think my next book is really going to be Warren comes back. So that's an example of how sometimes characters refuse to leave you until you finish telling their story. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a strange phenomenon. I don't know what it is about us as writers or whether somehow we get, we get possessed by these fictional people, but sometimes that's, that's how the stories get told. Um, and, you know, I do, I'm, I'm one of those writers that I do have a series, I have Rizzolian Dials, but every so often I like to do something different because you cannot write about the same people again and again and not get a little bored. Um, so I've done, I've gone off, you know, off, uh, I hate to use this term off the reservation, but I sometimes feel that's a really good way of saying it, where you do something that nobody expects that maybe you shouldn't be doing because your editor wants the same book again and again. Um, and that is a trap that we fall into when we write popular characters. Everybody wants the same book again and again. Um, and that is, that's a killer for creativity. So um, anyway, I do different things. And um, my latest book, I, I should talk about it because I suppose that's what my publisher really wants me to be talking about, is a book I've never done. It's, it's something I've never done before, which is a collaboration. Um, I don't like to collaborate. I am, well, I don't know about you, Jerry, but I am an introvert. I'm actually sort of like, I would be housebound if I could. <laughs> I, would, I would not talk to anybody if I could. I would just stay home and write. Um, but I was at this Christmas party a couple of years ago. Um, and I, I met a fellow writer I've, I've known for a long time um, named Gary Braver. His real name is Gary Gosh Garian. And I was following uh, the Me Too movement, which was really in the news back then. A lot of men doing naughty things. And I remember telling Gary, wouldn't it be interesting if we wrote a book about Me Too, but from both the male and the female point of view, we take a situation that's clearly wrong, a college professor who has an affair with his student and he's married. So we know this is a bad thing he's done, but maybe the women, the, the, the college student would see it a different way from what the professor would say. And wouldn't it be interesting if a man wrote the male point of view and a woman wrote the female point of view, we would kind of see how the world is viewed differently um, uh, based on gender. And he thought, oh, that's a great idea, let's do it. And next thing I know, a couple of weeks later, I get this chapter emailed to me that he had written. It was the first chapter of a book that later became Choose Me. So that was how the collaboration came about. He would, he would write the male point of view, Jack, and send it to me. And then I would write the female point of view, Taryn. And um, so we, we tormented, our characters tormented each other over email. That was really what it is. Um, he would write a chapter and my character would be mean to him and then he would be mean to her. And at the end of it, we had, we had a murder mystery <laughs> because we had, a, the one thing we did agree with was that the young woman would end up dead. She'd be, she would be found murdered. And the question would be, um, who did it? Did he do it? Um, he has a lot to protect. He has his life, his life that's just about to fall apart. Um, and, and that was how the collaboration came about. So it was, it was a, a different kind of a, of a process. Um, I don't think I'll be doing it again because it took twice as long to write a book in collaboration as it does when I write a book by myself. Uh, it's, which is funny because I was only writing half the book. So, but what I did learn about that and um, I, I don't want to make men feel like I'm, I'm against them or anything, but I learned that sometimes men think really, really naughty things. <laughs> and and I mean, one of the examples is that when, um, when Professor Jack Dorian first meets this, this college student, her name is Taryn, um, she's beautiful and she's brilliant and she's talented and she's going places. And I read Gary's chapter and it was very much about her physical appearance, you know, how beautiful she was, how seductive she was. Um, essentially, you know, reducing her down to a sexual creature. And I remember getting back to Gary and saying, you know, this is really offensive to me. Uh, we, we women, we want to be thought of as 
brilliant. Uh, we want to be appreciated for our personalities and our, and our brains. And um, he said, well, that's, that's how this character would think. And so I asked my husband, is that true? Is that how men would, would, is that how a man would see this brilliant young college student? And he said, yes, that's, that's how they think. Um, so what, one of the things that was interesting about this project was that I learned the difference between men and women in ways that I'd never known before, because he was writing very deeply from this male point of view, I mean, really getting into how men think and how men view the world. And in a way, it was, it was an education for me, just as I think it might have been an education for him when I would respond right away, you can't write this. This is, this is, this is offensive. Our women readers are not going to be happy with this. And um, so I, I think what he really became much more sensitive to how women, how women respond to certain kinds of fiction. Um, and um, the end was, I think the end was, was an interesting book, a murder mystery told from both the male and female point of view. Um, I'm looking at the time. Okay, I still have, <laughs> I, I still have some time. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Rizzoli and Viles because that's why people really read my books because they watch the television show. You know that the power of television is just overwhelming to me. Um, but I, my next book is coming out next year. It's the 13th in the Rizzoli and Isles series. It's called Listen to Me. And it is a really fun book for me because it takes, uh, it puts center stage Jane's mother, Angela. Now Jane's mom, um, Angela is in her late fifties. She is, her husband has left her for another woman. Um, so she's trying to learn how to make her, her way in this new world. Um, and her daughter's a homicide detective, right? So um, when she sees something, you know, she looks out her, her window. She spends a lot of time looking at her living room window at her neighborhood. And she sees things that she thinks are not right. Something is not right on her street. And no matter what she says to her daughter, nobody believes her. She calls the police, nobody believes her. So she has to take matters in her own, into her own hand, hands. And what I love about this is the idea that, you know, as women of a certain age, people stop listening to us. They don't hear us. It's, we, we became invisible, we become voiceless. And here is exactly what Angela is going through, which is where the title comes from, Listen to Me. Um, because in truth, there is something really wrong going on on her, her street. And even if, the, even if nobody believes her, she's going to prove herself as a pretty good detective, even though, <laughs> even though she's just a housewife in Revere. Um, so I, I love that particular story just because I feel like as I get older, I, I, I just really want to hear more from characters who are older women, women in their 50s and 60s and 70s, who um, maybe had brilliant careers, but now because of their age um, are no longer listened to. Um, and the next book I'm writing is, is based in Midcoast, Maine. It's, um, it's called Spyville. And the reason I came up with this idea was um, 30 years ago when we moved to Maine, um, my husband is a medical doctor and a lot of his patients, you know, you'd have to take a, a, an employment history for your patients to know what kind of illnesses they might be, um, they might have. And he would always ask, well, what did you do for a living? And his patients would say, I worked in Washington. And my husband would say, what did you do there? And the answer was always, oh, I can't talk about it. <laughs> so what we found out we later on from a realtor was that we have a lot of CIA retired living in Midcoast, Maine. Um, and I, you know, I started thinking, why are they here? What drew them here? And what does a retired spy do for the rest of his life? So um, the idea was that we have a community of retired spies who, who know each other. Um, and, one, and one of them who's, who is actually here to escape some very bad memories of things she did as a spy is called back to work and she doesn't wanna go. Um, so what would her colleagues do to help her out? Anyway, that's, that was the idea um, behind Spyville. And um, again, I get to work with a, a character who's in her 60s, um, a woman who's very, very talented and very capable. Um, but maybe, maybe that's, maybe being an older woman is actually the best cover of all. Because as I said, we are ignored and you can walk into a room and nobody looks at the gray haired lady, even though she's the one who's the most dangerous person in the room. Um, and that's, that's the latest. I, I mean, I, I would like to open up to questions. So I think we are, if anybody has them, please, 
please ask whatever you want because Jerry and I are anxious to talk. <laughs> Thanks, Tess and Jerry. And please, yes, unmute if you'd like to ask. You can drop questions in the chat. I'd be happy to ask them for you if you'd prefer. But let's go. We've got a good solid 20 minutes that we can use here. Ah, okay. I, can I ask a question? Sure, Tyler. Um, I was thinking about Louise Penny, the Canadian writer, talked mm -hmm. about very deliberately crafting Armand Gamache. She wanted to have a decent man. If she was lucky enough for her series to get taken up by the public, she cared very much about spending time with somebody that she actually liked. Um, and I always thought that was kind of an interesting observation. And because both of you have recurring heroes and heroines and other cast members, I was kind of curious about what your thought process was in creating them and also about the challenges of letting them grow and change when you found a readership for a recurring character. Well, I, I'll, I'll start since I call your name. <laughs> um, I'll start by saying Jane Rizzoli was not somebody I created because I liked her. In fact, when I created her, she was a secondary character. She was supposed to die in that book, in The Surgeon. Um, she, there was a, the, the main character was somebody completely different. And I, I don't know if, if Jerry, you come across the same phenomenon, but it, to me, it's always the secondary characters that seem to blossom when you're not paying attention to them. And sometimes they will take over a story. So Jane Rizzoli, who was frankly a bitch at, from the very beginning, um, and nobody likes her, um, but in the course of writing that story, she became, I don't know, very real to me. And I understood why she was a bitch, I understood um, that she was brilliant, that she was, she was unhappy because she wasn't being listened to. Um, and when it came time for her death scene, <laughs> I couldn't do it. So she, she survived and then she became the star of this whole series. And, and, and even though I didn't like her to begin with, it, it's like, you know, it's like a person that you meet for the first time at first, they may turn you off, but then with repeated um, exposure, you, you, you start to see the good sides of them. You start to see that this person is worth worthy of being a friend. So um, yeah, my characters, I've, I've never started off creating them because I want to like them. I always start creating them because they're interesting. Jerry. I have a question. Oh, uh, Jerry might want to finish that side. Go ahead. Been, I have a, a bit of a counter to that. I created Jack McMorrow uh, uh, because at the times I, I I wanted to work for the New York Times for the, you know, that was my plan. And then I, I got put down deep roots in central Maine. So I invented this guy who did work for the New York Times. So I could sort of live vicariously through him. And also he did all the things that I really wanted to be able to do, uh, but I couldn't because I had a family and I had kids and I couldn't get fired for punching out someone, you know, or, or carrying a gun to work or all these things. So I, I, so I think I really, it was a little bit of a Walter Mitty sort of thing. Uh, I'll just end, but I have to tell you a little, just a funny little thing about that. I think I'd written three or four of these books. They were doing well, you know, New York Times said that la, 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 la. And, you know, I started to, I, I still catch myself when I think about it. Uh, I started to become him. So he, we did the same job, which was kind of, uh, I was a columnist at the time and he was this freelance kind of newspaper guy, which is kind of like a columnist. And I was writing a lot of crime. He was involved in writing a lot of crime, but I, I remember kind of coming into the newsroom with this sort of swagger, you know, like, don't screw with me. Do you know who I am? <laughs> and, but in reality, I was still Jerry Boyle, you know, taking my kids to soccer practice and, and had to be home at a certain time because someone had to, you know, the youngest had to be picked up at daycare. But this other person who uh, I had invented and have been with ever since um, didn't have to do any of that. And so he was like my imaginary cool friend, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, so, so it isn't, you know, and I do like him. And, and even when he does something that I don't quite agree with. It doesn't happen all that often. It's something that I, that I thought of and would have done if cooler heads hadn't prevailed. So 
so anyway, there you but, go. You know, that's really true. We we write we write better, smarter, prettier versions of ourselves, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> but the people we would like to be if we exactly if we, yeah yeah. And we win we, all the fights, you know. We win all the fights. It's inc it's just. <laughs> so there was that. What was the other question? Was it yeah. Michal? No. What was it? Natalie. Hi, it's up, it's up I, I was wondering if you as authors realize how we love your characters so much. In Louise Penny's books, uh, Claire's husband died and I'm still mourning her husband. And I, I remember when Ruth's duck flew away and was gone for two books. And when the duck came back, I felt like getting the champagne out, like, oh my God, the duck is back. I'm so happy. And do you realize how I, those characters are alive for us? They truly are. Well, you know, they're alive for us as well, which is why I I will not I will not kill a major character in any of my books. I just I just can't do that. Um, no, I'll, I'll kill the ones that nobody likes, but, um, but the ones that people love, you know, I can't kill them either. Jerry? Yeah, I, I wouldn't, kill, well, I don't know what I'm doing, but I, I do think that uh, I'm quite fond of them. And when you say they seem real and people, and you, you feel a, a real investment in them, well, that's, that's why we write them. You know, we don't want you to just kind of skim through the pages and put the book down and never think about it again. You know, at least that's that's the the uh, kind of vaulted goal that you have. That is that these people you have invented are as real to the to your readers as they are to you. And so I think that's what keeps you going. I don't know. Sometimes if tests have you're going along and you know it isn't quite right. You know that the the dialogue isn't quite right or the character isn't fully realized or just or got a little stale halfway because you were kind of put it on autopilot for a little while and then I think what drags you back and makes you do it again and again or get rid of that character altogether just is because you don't want to just be inventing something that has a shelf life of 20 minutes it's too hard you know it's too hard to invent all these people and and then if you're writing well and if you really care about what you're writing, you know, as Tessa, we care about them too. We really care about them. You know, you, we've spent years with them. You know, I, I know more about Jack McMorrow than I do all my friends, some of my relatives. You know, I, th I often say that my only, the only people I know better are in my immediate family. And so, so it's kind of a strange, strange thing, you know, that you've spent... 20 years, uh, 15 years, so close to someone who's only real in your imagination. And, you know, it, having continuing characters like this also adds to the challenge of, they can't stay the same <laughs> uh, over 20 books or well, however long or how many years you're, you're working with them. They, they have to feel as if they're moving forward with their lives as to uh, as well. Otherwise, it just feels like a TV sitcom. So um, I know that that my challenge has always been always trying to in, introduce some kind of crisis in their lives that moves them forward, that they learn something from. Um, you know, Jane Rizzoli, as I mentioned, starts off being very unlikable, but she's unlikable because she's unhappy, and she finds happiness. She gets she she falls in love. She has a child. She gets married. And now in the later books, she's, she's much, much happier and she's more content and, and she's gotten respect. So you see that, that character arc as well. But I, the other thing that's, a dangerous, that's dangerous though is you can never have your characters be entirely happy because once they're happy, the arc is over and the series is over. So somebody is always in crisis. <laughs> Yeah, there's always a conflict of yeah. some sort. If you have, I, I don't know if Tess, have you, have you had, I've had in this case, in the book that Robbed Blind that comes out next year, I have, uh, McMorrow is throwing himself into these, into these situations over and over. And, and finally his, his partner, Roxanne says, what are you looking for? What, what is this kind of Don Quixote thing you've been doing for so long? What, what, 
where does it end? You know, and which was a pretty obvious uh, way of expressing the question we ask, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we writing these books? What is the point and where does it end? And I think that when you become a writer of a certain age, you know, then you have to say, well, why do I start, you know, finish one and start another? Why do I have one not finished? I'm already thinking about another one. What is it about these people? You know, we, we get older. These people are, as long as we're around, are kind of immortal. You know, they're, they are, uh, there's something inside us. And I try to ad address that in the book in, in terms of the character and the questions that are asked of him because he makes his, everyone's life very difficult around him because he's pursuing all this. And he's, he's looking for something. Well, you'll have to read it to see what his answer is. <laughs> no giveaways, Jerry. Right. Um, thank you both. And thank you for Ty to Tyla and Natalie for continuing the conversation. Who else has questions? Oh, here's this awkward silence that I was worried about. <laughs> well, Deborah, did you, did you, you know, we can't just call on people, right? Oh, okay. There's a, there's a question up on the chat uh, from Doug Lay. How much research do we do for our books? Jerry? Well, I mean, you're a reporter, so. Right. Some, I had the advantage of doing the job that my, my protagonist did. So I would often just had, so the research wasn't about the way he did the job, but I love the research uh, because I think of, you know, what subject do I want to spend a year with that I will find interesting? It's very selfish, really. Uh, if it's not interesting to me, I don't, I, I pass over it. Uh, in, you know, in some books, I've, I've known nothing about a subject that he's going to report on, which is really the whole general assignment sort of reporter's exercise. You're, every week you would learn enough about something entirely new to convince 50,000 people that you knew a lot about it. And so, uh, so he continues that, but I think the research was fun. And in fact, I had to be careful not to get so caught up in the research that I sort of, I wouldn't, I, it was, it became almost like um, more fun than writing the book. You know, I just keep researching. And when I wrote a book that had to do with the Arnold Trail, Benedict Arnold and, and going into Quebec and, and I, you know, I canoed the Kennebec, you know, and I followed the route and I went to Quebec and I read everything and I went to the main state archives and I looked at all the primary documents, you know, I had the little gloves on and, you know, I'm going, it was like, I was, I was an historian. And at some point I had to cut it off because I could have just kept doing that for years. You know, I, I was really fascinated by it personally. Uh, and so so the research I'm sure for you is also Tess, is just, that's kind of like the gravy in some ways. Yeah. It is, it's a way of vicariously living somebody else's life. What is it like to be an airline pilot or what is it like to be an astronaut? I mean, you get to, you get to live in somebody else's world for a short time. Um, and, and the purpose of the research is just to give it that enough of an air of authenticity, not to become an expert necessarily, because Jerry's absolutely right. That is the danger. You get carried away because you're having so much fun. And when I, you know, I did a book called Gravity about the International Space Station, and that was a year of solid research. Um, it was included going to, you know, to both um, Johnson Space Center and then Cape Canaveral and, and talking to people for a lot to the point where by the end of that year, I was, my dreams were all about weightlessness. I did not have gravity in my dreams. Um, so you can get carried away, you can get into trouble. I almost got arrested <laughs> on, that, on that research trip. Um, but it's, um, you, want, you want to be as accurate as you can be. And no matter how good your research, you are always gonna get something wrong about the gun. That's, you know, I, I don't know why. I, I started asking people I know who, who are weapons people, but it seemed that I made so many mistakes when it came to guns that I refer to them. As, I refer to them as weapons. I talk about what kind of a gun they are because there'll be somebody who'll email me and say, you stupid woman, you don't know what this gun really, you know. So um, that, that is the one thing that there always seems to be somebody who knows a lot more than us about, about guns. I remember one, one time talking, Robert Parker, was asked at a thing and we were there and he, 
someone said, uh, how do you know so much about the Boston Mafia? And he said, I don't know anything about the Boston Mafia, but I know more than you. <laughs> and he said, that's all I need to know. And so you, ha you do have to cut it off. Uh, so the gun thing though is, is a minefield. And so for a while, I only, I bought the guns that were gonna be in the book so that no one could say, well, you've never fired a Glock 17, you know? And, and so that was my way of protecting myself. Cause I, I remember a book where I got, I made a mistake and oh man, you know, it was like I'd killed a puppy. It was, uh, <laughs> yes. it was a huge issue. So. And, and the real trouble with research is that you don't know what you don't know. So right. you will put something that you'll be feel perfectly fine uh, that you think you know it and uh, only then do you realize you've made a mistake when you start right. getting the letters and oh we get letters we get people love to point out to authors all the mistakes they've made I don't know why it just seems like there's people just waiting out there to tell us on page 283 you know <laughs> yeah yeah uh, these next two questions in the chat sort of um we could combine them, I think. So one, Natalie is asking, who are your favorite authors and what are you reading now? And then the other is, when you read for pleasure, what types of novels do you gravitate to? In other words, who inspires you? Well, I tend to, strangely enough, I tend to read nonfiction. Um, when, I'm, when I'm lying in bed and I pick up a book, it tends to be, um, something about a subject I'm interested in, whether it's about food. I mean, my father was a, was a, he had a restaurant, he was a cook. So anything to do about food or um, botany or, um, you, know, you know, the way Anthony Bourdain used to write. I used to, I love that stuff. Or um, Michael Pollan who writes about food and botany. Um, I'm trying to think about the last, last I, because I read so many galleys um, from people who, whose books are about to come out. I do a lot of galley reading. And unfortunately, because I just see the galley, I always forget what the title was. Um, but overall, when I think about what, if I'm to read suspense novelists, um, I love this bevy of women whose names just all happen to be Lisa. You know, Lisa Gardner, Lisa Scottolini, Lisa Unger. Um, there's something about that name that seems to, to create great thriller writers and women. Well, um, I also read a lot of nonfiction. I'm reading a book right now about migration and the and of birds and all the really amazing things that they are uh, finding out about how birds migrate. You know, there's a kind of swift that flies 7,200 miles uh, in its migration every year. There are birds that fly 3,000 miles without stopping, without eating. All their, so, because I was a frustrated kind of uh, naturalist, field field biologist in my early years. Uh, but when I read a lot of history all the time, my son and I exchange books about American history, world history. I just got one on the Crimean War that's about this thick. And so we're going to read, I'll read that and pass it on to him. And then we can talk about it. In terms of suspense and crime, you know, there, I find that um, I have to, I have to, there are only a few, you know, there are a lot, everybody's so good so that I'm either really threatened by them, you know, when I'm reading it, I'm thinking, whoa, how did they come up with that? Or, you know, this dialogue is just rocking, you know? And so then I get kind of bummed out. So, so I, I so I end up going back to sort of these go-tos and, and, uh, and my go-to when I, before I, one thing, I don't read any fiction uh, or crime fiction when I'm writing crime fiction, which gives me a narrow window to actually read it. And when I do, I need, I want something that inspires me a little bit. Uh, and the two things, P.D. James, okay, because I, she writes completely, completely differently for me. It's a different world. It's a different style, but the, the prose is so perfect. You know, there's, there's something inspiring about the way the words all go together. And then I'm also, I, I read one of those for, you know, for the umpteenth time. And then I'll also read a John D. McDonald, Travis McGee novel, which I, which is kind of where I started before I was actually writing these. I was reading those and marveling at how he could in two or three pages create this very, very real people. And, um, and so I'll, I will read those. I will, I will bounce from others, you know, that, 
uh, <clears throat> but I, I think I also, you know, I, I don't know why I always end up going back to people who are before our time. You know, I like to go back to a different time when there's something a little more pure about the genre in, you know, the 1940s. Uh, Dashiell Hammett, you know, you can kind of see the, it's like uh, some, I don't know, Keith Richards going back to listen to Robert Johnson, you know, that because it's the stripped down version of what everybody's doing. And so that's where, where I will go. But I highly recommend this book about birds and migration if you're interested in that. So, you know, people would ask me that in, at other things and, you know, I'll come up with something. Well, I've been reading this thing about beavers, you know, and, and I can see people looking at it like, well, what? <laughs> you know, but I don't know, did the Beatles go home and listen to the Rolling Stones all night? I kind of doubt it. They listen to jazz and they listen to classical music and they listen to ragtime or something. So yeah. there's a long answer. We're probably getting close. Thank you. We are close. Unless somebody has a super quick question or comment before we close out tonight. I'll just wait just a few seconds. There's got to be somebody who has something else to say. Be that person. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't know. I think they're all souped out. Yeah. Well, I'm just sorry we're not there in person to have your soup because like, the one time I was there, the soup was excellent. <laughs> oh, good. That is good to hear. And you know, I, I can't thank you both enough. Um, this is a great partnership. Um, and we made it work this year, despite it all. And I'm just thrilled that you joined us. Um, you know, just your overview of character development. I had no idea where you guys were going to go tonight. And it has been fascinating to listen to both of you talk about character development and your attachment to your, your characters. And from a reader's point of view, it just really strikes a chord with me, I'm sure with the rest of the audience as well. Um, great sneak previews for upcoming books. Thank you very much. I'm intrigued. Um, and also how you both sort of made a strategy around COVID really in, in the way you um, attacked that or didn't. Uh, so that was really fascinating. So um, I, again, want to thank both of you for making our soup and suspense come to life this year. Uh, we missed it last year and maybe next year we'll be able to do this in person again. Um, so I will close out by saying uh, this concludes our presentation for this evening. And please note that we plan to skip next week's Wednesday uh, series um, so that all of us can join the Historical Society's presentation. All of us at Vos Library, thank you for attending our Vos or Virtual Wednesday series. And we hope that you'll help spread the word and also join us on Wednesday, November 10th at 7 p.m. when Chris Toy shares his secret wonton soup recipe. We hope to see you there. Good night, be well, and stay healthy, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.